our topic today is uh, it's a big topic, uh, a big topic generally worldwide. Everyone's talking about it um, and have been talking about it for a long time. Uh, but now maybe it's becoming uh, it's becoming a crunch issue in politics. The incoming American president is saying for the first time that America is going to take this uh, very seriously. So it's it's really uh, a, a big thing, climate change, the environment, etc. And um, lots of environmental discussion in the news. Uh, and I had talked about what do we do? Do we recycle or do we become detached? Do we consider that it's just too big an issue for us to deal with? So just chant Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, so how do, how do we deal with it? Uh, um, and are we willing to do anything to help? And as well as bigger question is, why should we? It's the material world after all. It's not even the spiritual world. So why why, why bother? So these are um, all relevant questions. You could consider not very um, not very good questions. <laughs> But what I want to talk about is, is why we should think and act in a way that, um, no, why we should, different ways we, we could think or act, basically. Um, but in relation to Krishna, why, why would a Krishna devotee be interested in this at all? So um, what does it have to do with us? Here we are in our comfortable homes. We can afford to be on Zoom, which means we have computers or phones or tablets. So we're doing quite well. Uh, why do we have to worry about it? Surely, if there's a problem, the scientists are going to sort it out, or the politicians, etc. Um, and to put it very simply, to go right back into the Vedic era, which is some thousands of years ago, um, the Vedas are the oldest books of philosophy known to man. And there's a concept in the Vedas that has permeated all Indian traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, the whole way the subcontinent uh, thinks, but also through Buddhism into China, into Japan, and through Vaishnavism into uh, Burma and Cambodia and Laos and right up to Bali and Fiji. So the whole of the East has been influenced by certain ways of thinking that stem from the Indian subcontinent and stem uh, largely from the Vedas, these Vedic texts. And there's a concept in the Rig Veda called Ritta, a concept no one talks about anymore, but it's important for our conversation. And it, it means a cosmic, cosmic order. Ritta means cosmic order. There's an assumption that everything is highly organized. Now that's a, a philosophical assumption. Why is that important? Because um, out of that assumption comes another assumption that if everything is highly organized, some Indian seers were just observing the planets and the trees and how the whole ecosystem works. And it is highly organized. From an acorn, an oak tree grows, not a beech tree, not a large tree, and an oak tree. And the traffic system of the stars is quite precise. If one star goes out of orbit, just a kilometer, everything starts to bump into each other. Now, we think that, you know, there's a traffic system in, in uh, East London, and we consider that intelligence has divided, devised it. Uh, you would consider that unless you drove in the traffic system, I presume, but, but it seems like it's organized. And they're just observing that, well, this is also highly organized. So there is cosmic order, but if there is, this is huge. And this was organized before I was born. And this will continue on after I'm gone. So I'm a really small part of this. This is another philosophical assumption. One is that there is cosmic order. The other is that I'm only a small part of it, which means I am a servant of the greater whole. Now, Abrahamic thinking, which is the other big thinking of the planet from the Middle East, mainly over towards the West, is that God created everything and made us the masters of the world. And if we're really pious, then we do good stewardship, but we're the masters, not the servants. This is a very different way of thinking. So this, I wanted just to mention this as a starting block, shall we say. This is why this idea of being a servant 
is is very important and it, it it's an assumption that we make we are we are the servant of the greater whole um and in that context we have a role to play because if we're part of a big machine and we're a tiny little cog no matter how small we are every cog has a part to play and if the cog isn't doing its thing it's not contributing being a servant of the greater whole it's detracting from the greater whole so it's important that we engage in the proper way. This is where the idea of Dharma arises, the what is the right thing to do. Uh, this, this is the idea of Dharma. So we must find our role individually. And also it comes up with the idea that if everything is, if there's a greater whole that's highly organized, then in that holistic way of looking at things, everything is interconnected, interacting, and interdependent. Everything is connected in some way. It's inter everything is interacting with each other and everything is dependent on each other. And these are, again, important assumptions, but observing how nature works, we see that that's how the world works. So um, our role will help bring balance to the whole order, even though our part to play is minuscule. It's a tiny part to play. So this, this is an assumption of Vedic sages thousands of years ago, just observing the world around them. Quite philosophical, but quite profound into, into how it hits the ground. So we do what we do because it's the right thing to do. That becomes the, the, the Vedic motivation, the motivation for the Dharmic person. You do what, what you do because it's the right thing to do. So how do we respond to climate change? We respond because it's the right thing to do not because we're freaked out by the science, not because someone is telling us a gloomy story that if it goes up another 1% then all these horrible things are going to happen. That's all very nice, but kind of selfish. But what is the right thing for me to do now? Okay, maybe I've acted like an idiot up to this point, but what is the right thing to do now? Get into our groove, get into our, our cogness, find out what's the, what, what is my role to play in the bigger picture. So, so that's, that's the beginning. What does it have to do to us? Uh, this is what it has to do for us. This, why should we be concerned about the environment? Well, what's the right thing to do in, in the greater whole? That, so that's the thinking. And let's make the picture bigger. If we look at the idea of Dharma, of doing the right thing, how do you know what is the right thing? How do you discern it on a day-to-day -day basis? How do you decide the right thing? And the Mahabharata particularly talks about this. And in a number of places, Krishna says, Bhishma says, a number of people say, ahimsa, not being cruel. This is the basic method of discernment, how to do the least hurtful thing. And that's how you know what is the right thing to do. Because every circumstance we walk into is different. The whole of the Mahabharata is bigger than the Iliad and Odyssey, these ancient uh, texts. S multiply them by six, put them together, and the Mahabharata is bigger than both of them. And it's a text all about Dharma, all about morality, all about ethics, all about how to do the right thing. And it doesn't solve any of the dilemmas that it gives you. All the characters are flawed in some way. All of them have to make decisions. When they make a decision, you're reading it, you go, no, don't do that. Or you're saying, yes, yes, go on, do it. Like Yudhisthira keeps not fighting. And as you're reading it, you're getting frustrated thinking, no, come on, you got to fight now. <laughs> you know, they just burned down the big palace of Shalak. They were trying to kill you. You got to fight now. They tried to disrobe Draupadi. You got to fight now. And he doesn't fight. He's, he has he's something else going on in his head. But we're frustrated looking at this. And this reflects on us and our dharma and our ability to discern dharma. This is what the text is all about. It's not giving us rules that you read this book and this is how you lead your life. It's giving you principles by which you lead your life and showing you that you have to make your own decision in your own time, in your own place. So ahimsa is, how, is what helps us do that. And if we start to practice ahimsa, if we start to try and not be hurtful, try and not be cruel, try to not be violent, our life begins to change. Our lifestyle begins to change. We, we work consciously not to say hurtful things to people. We obviously don't kill people. 
we obviously don't you know beat them etc but also we just don't we don't use our tongue to hurt them i mean if you if you call a woman fat you could destroy her for the rest of her life it could be much worse than physical violence you know if you say to some young chap that he's not worth it you're just worthless you have no function in society no one will ever take you seriously again it could destroy a person so how do you not be cruel in your intention in your words and your actions and if you start to act like that you develop karuna which is compassion the quality of compassion and compassion let's take the big compassion word and make it very simple let's just say kindness it's it doesn't cost us anything to be kind we can all be kind there's always something you're standing at a bus stop and you look at someone who just looks a little bit down in the mouth some old lady or something and you just uh, sit down and spend a few moments talking simply that just being kind to people so it's it's not only not being cruel it's being proactive it's doing something positive so these are two important qualities when we go later on to talk about the environment but the bigger issue is atma the concept of atma which is also found in the rig veda then the upanishads then the mahabharata bhagavad gita the ramayana all the texts the puranas the idea of atma is the concept of the self who are we really are we this body are we the mind are we the intellect or are we the spiritual element and i won't spend a lot of time on this you've possibly heard that philosophical idea before basic vedanta basic sankhya that there are two energies at play one is material one is spiritual material is temporary spiritual is eternal we are the eternal energy and every life force the difference between material and spiritual is life material energy is dead and spiritual energy is alive and when they come in contact when spirit comes in contact with my body i have the appearance my body has the appearance of life as soon as the spirit leaves the body phew, the body's gone and begins to decompose immediately begins to degenerate immediately so there's there's two different energies one is degenerating one is elevating so if we accept that idea then the concept in the bhagavad gita in the 5th chapter of samadarshanaha the sage by virtue of true knowledge sees with equal vision an elephant a, a, a gentle brahman um, um a worker in the docks you know a, a monkey <laughs> whatever anywhere that there's life it doesn't matter what the status is in terms of caste or creed or religion or even species so not only is this person not racist when it, where he sees life or he she sees life you're looking at a black person and a white person you're looking at a hindu and a jew but you're looking at a human and a possum and you're looking at this is this is all life all to be treated with respect treated equally and not uh uh equitably is is different how i treat a possum and how i treat a human being is equitably going to be different but equally respected equally given the right for life so that idea of samadarshana means that this tradition is not speciesist it's not only not racist it's not gender specific it's not speciesist we don't say that humans are better than other species all life is sacred all life is special all life is to be respected now if you think like that your whole ap approach to the environment around you has to change because how then how do you deal with um tigers and elephants and crocodiles and all kinds of species that are under threat from humans we have legal systems that favor humans they're based on the concept legal concept of human dignity not the dignity of all life that this philosophical perspective would ask for but human dignity that's very specific and very speciesist which means the um kind of uh, environmental policy you can legally begin to discuss is very limited if you change that policy and say that the legal system needs to be based on uh, a, a reverence for all life or the, uh, the idea of, of the dignity of all life then you can have environmental policies that mean human impact is illegal because other species have rights as well 
So, so anyway, it's interesting. This philosophy practically challenges our current legal system in a very substantial way. And also um, the whole idea of environmental policy at a high legal, political and economic level. And now let's go to um, another, another place. And this is looking at Krishna and climate because that's the title of the talk. <laughs> Um, and if we look at uh, the Isupanishad, it says, Isava Syamidam Sarvam, Yat Kincha Jagat Yam Jagat Tena Yuktena Bahanjita Matkasha Kasya Savitanam. So it says, uh, Everything animate and inanimate in the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. Therefore, one should only accept that set aside as one's quota, ignoring everything else, knowing well to whom it belongs. So that's the Upanishad to everything in this universe, this cosmic order is owned and controlled. There is intelligence behind it and it's not ours. So again, we're already servants. Now we're understanding who's the boss. So there's someone actually is in charge of this. And if we understand that, and that's that verse was quoted by Gandhi often in terms of environmental theory. Uh, and it's, it's a basic environmental theory coming from Upanishadic sources. Um, but if we look at the example, and that's kind of philosophical and theoretical and very nice, but then we look at Krishna in Vrindavan. So God comes down as an avatar. How does he come down? Well, before we get on to Krishna, let's talk about Rama, because Rama comes first anyway. Um, oh, let's talk about Matsya, because he's the very first of the avatars, isn't he? So how does Krishna come down to the planet? First, he comes down as a fish, then a tortoise, then a half a man and half a lion. This is pretty funky stuff. So he's Krishna is not very concerned about species, obviously. He's obviously not totally favoring the human species. He comes down as a boar. You know, he's, <laughs> these are quite a lot of animals and fish. And a half a man and a half a lion. He really doesn't care about species. He's really saying to the humans, get over yourself. You're not the only show in town. I'm willing to come down as all these things. You're not willing to do it because you're just too proud. Because humans, that's where it's at. Krishna doesn't care. Interesting. Then he comes down as Rama. Well, Rama is a fully fledged human, big guy, strong guy with a bow and arrows and all that kind of stuff. So he goes and he goes and fights Ravana for a good cause, all about dharma. It's all brilliant. Yet, who's his army? Hardly a human to be seen. Monkeys, Jitayu, the big vulture, the bears, even squirrels. I mean, this is a pretty strange looking army. Again, is he favoring humans? Are humans the only show in town here? Not really. And it's interesting as well. All the avatars are different colors. Rama is green. <laughs> he lives in a forest. <laughs> You know, he's born and brought up in Iodia, a big city, and he's a big prince and everything. He moves to a forest without, a, without even thinking about it. And when he moved to the forest, he didn't take anything with him. He didn't take a big cartload of riches and stuff. He just moved out with what he had. You know, as, what would a forest dweller need? He brought that. He just brought his weapons. And his brother and his wife came, and that was it. And they had nothing. So they made do. And they, they live perfectly happily. The thing about Ram going to the forest was he went there happily. And, and that's part of the thing for us that we look at that and say, I wouldn't do that. You know, you have palatial riches and servants and all the stuff you need and whatever sweets you want. You just ring a bell and it comes your way. And then you're asked to go and live in the forest, which means you have to make your own house out of, you know, some, I don't know how you make a house. <laughs> So I wouldn't, I wouldn't survive five minutes. <laughs> Yet Ram went there without, without thinking twice about it because he has no problem with nature. And when he wanted an army, he had this whole army of non-humans, not an issue for him because he came to take the love of everybody, to take everyone's service. So you're a servant of the greater whole. And then what's the thinking behind the greater whole is the greater person. So he came to take that service, not only from humans, he's showing us that every form of life has service to give and he'll accept it. And he'll come down in animal forms so that even animals can approach him. No issue. 
He doesn't think twice about it. This is dynamic environmental theory. This is a complete game changer. So not only are we talking philosophically about Samadarshanha, equal vision, but we're looking at how God himself acts in the world. Then we have Krishna and Vrindavan. So again, Krishna is born the son of a Kshatriya, but as a child gets taken off to the country. And he's just in the middle of the country, Gokul, and they're moving around in, in carts pulled by oxes. And his father's a cowherd man. And he plays with, with little calves when he's a kid. It, all his pastimes are all to do with Vrindavan. And then there's Govardhan Hill. And what does he do? He goes to Govardhan Hill. So there's this Vedic religion where they offer, do offerings to Indra. And he says, uh, what are you doing that for? You have this wonderful hill here, and this hill gives you everything you need. It's giving you water, it's giving you crops, it's giving you grazing for the animals. So go worship the hill. Isn't that more intelligent than worshiping, you know, Indra? He doesn't need it. And it's kind of sounds atheistic. <laughs> Yet he's actually favoring nature, and everyone worships the hill. And Indra re responds, and Indra gets defeated. And and the the Krishna anoints the hill. Krishna's pastimes are full of hills and lakes and trees and shrubs and animals. It's all to do with nature. And he's just showing us these are all I, these are all sacred because I love them. These are why do we worship Tulsi? Krishna likes Tulsi. Why do we like peacocks? Krishna likes peacocks. Why do we like cows? Krishna likes cows. <laughs> it's not very complicated. It's not a big religious thing. In actual fact, Krishna is slightly non-religious in the whole thing. He's showing us something more important. He's showing us the thinking behind religion. This is very dynamic, and it's done in this environmental context. How does Krishna deal with pollution? Well, the story of Kaliya. Kaliya turns up in Vrindavan, and he finds a little lake in the Yamuna River, and he situates himself there, and he's a big, powerful snake. And he's, he's very so powerful that when he breathes, it's just poison. And all that poison just goes into the atmosphere. And the birds flying over that part of the Yamuna just drop down dead. And it's, it's being pushed out into the fields. So Krishna comes and he plays with them. He dances on his head. Kaliya can't do anything about it. He's a big, huge, powerful snake. And this kid <laughs> comes and starts dancing on his head, which is pretty embarrassing for Kaliya. What's his, what's his response to pollution? He just takes it out and he, he banishes Kaliya to somewhere where he can pollute in peace. Krishna understands that there's dirty things in the universe. That's life, but not here. Go back to where you belong. Just help recreate the balance. It's interesting Krishna doesn't kill Kaliya. He's a source of pollution, but he was born like that. He was born into a body that was polluted. This was just his life. And as soon as he became humble and he recognized who Krishna was, as soon as he was defeated and he surrendered, Krishna stopped beating him up <laughs> and sent him on his way because Krishna loves him and he allowed Kaliya to love back. So it's interesting, uh, another just an interesting uh, idea. Devotees we preserve, sustain, and value our environment because it makes Krishna happy. And that's that because everything is part of Krishna. Krishna, if you have affection for the Lord, you have affection for everything connected to the Lord, which is everything. If you have affection for the Lord, you have affection with every person connected with the Lord, which is all people. And who are those people? They're humans, they're dogs, they're cats, they're giraffes, they're whatever. Any life form is a person who Krishna has a connection with, who Krishna is sustaining in some way. So therefore, it's our happiness to also sustain them. This, again, is a very subtle form uh, of environmental theory. The and just to mention one other thing before the conclusion, our internal climate creates our external climate. 
So when Arjuna says in the Bhagavad Gita, he asks Krishna, he says, by what is one impelled to wrong action, even though you don't set out to do it like that? You, you get up in the morning, you think, I want to do good today, and you end up completely messing up. How, how does that happen? And Krishna says, it's just your desire, your bad desire. He said, lust, anger, and greed. And if you think, what's behind the environmental crisis? Lust, anger, and greed. We don't need half the food we have in our shops. We don't need half the material facility we have. We prove that by buying new things every year when we could just sustain the old ones. We don't need an iPad 19. We could do with an iPad 2. You know, we don't need a new computer every couple of years. We, I, my computer I'm speaking to you now is seven years old. We're doing quite well, aren't we? You know, how do you think differently? How do you, how do you work on your internal climate? And, and because that is what affects the external climate. Our external climate has problems because we have problems deep in our hearts. We're not, we're not able to deal with the issues of lust, anger, and greed within ourselves. And that, that's kind of a takeaway from this. The conclusion, I would say, for this I hope, We'll have questions and comments and you interrogate all this and show me how I'm wrong. Uh, that love is a more profound motivation in preserving nature than stories of doom and climate change, more sustainable than dharmic religious ideas, political, economic, scientific, medical, or warm and fuzzy reasons. If you're kind of a hippie and you just think it's cool. Um, and no, no matter how wonderful all those reasons can be, love is still the most profound, profound motivation that we can have. So love of Krishna and love that love extending to Krishna's environment. Yes, then we should recycle. We can do something, including caring and being kind to other living beings. No, we shouldn't be scared about all this because nature has its cycles. And in cycles, there's always change. This is just another change. If we're messing around with the cycles, we're going to suffer. Um, maybe we should stop messing around with them. Um, but we shouldn't be scared because this is only natural development. But the idea of the internal climate creating the external climate is something we can work on very positively. In following ahimsa, being kind to others, in developing compassion and kindness, because that's what Krishna wants us to do. Not simply because it's, well, it's the right thing to do. It's more than Dharma. It, it includes Dharma, but it's more than Dharma. If I do what Krishna wants me to do, I'm fulfilling everything I would do in Dharma. It's just Dharma plus. It's Ahimsa plus. It's Karuna plus. Um, and that will help us get over our short-term thinking over long-term thinking, our idea of profit over people. When I say people, I mean all living beings. And um, so we need to be grateful, which is dharmic. We need to be thoughtful, which is ahimsa. We need to be caring, which is karuna. And we need to be loving, which is Krishna. And we could learn to see nature as Krishna's garden and that we as servants are the gardeners of this beautiful parkland of Krishna. Thank you. Thank you so much. That gave us a, a, a lot to um, digest. And, and also, um, I'm sure there's, there's actually lots of questions now. Um, we've had a couple in the chat, but I, I wondered if anybody wants to um, uh, be brave and, and ask the question directly. Um, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to do so. I can I can jump in um, with with one to start with. Um, I, I guess um, you, you seem to be you seem to be going much much deeper than I expected we would. <laughs> We've gone from this really superficial level of just doing good things because it's the law, 
you've gone down, you know, Dharma and, and, and beyond that even further with actually we should do this because it pleases Krishna. Um, so can you give us some, <laughs> some insights into um, how we can keep that depth of pursuit in how we might respond to climate change and, and some of the things that we can do, but how do we keep reminding ourselves of that, the, the depth of, by which we should act rather than just getting caught up in the superficial reasons? Well, I must admit, I'm, I'm born of a generation that didn't give a damn about the environment. Uh, you know, a lot of people have been born into a social situation where there is recycling. It's just a norm. Recycling is something that developed through my lifetime. So I wasn't, I was in my late twenties, at least before I heard of the idea of recycling as, as we talk about it now, when I was a kid, um, you had a bin, quite a small metal bin that all the household refuse, everything went into. And that bin was emptied once a week. This was a family of seven people and it all fit into quite a, quite a small metal bin, as I say. Now we have three quite large bins. So, so it's, it's not only that we didn't have the same awareness, we didn't have the same waste. You know, there wasn't the same plastic production, everything. When you bought food, it was, you walked into a shop, it was just loose. And then you put it into a paper bag or a string bag and brought it home. Uh, there, there, there were few plastic bags. It wasn't a culture. So that all became a culture and created its own problems and everything. So um, I wasn't very conscious of environmental things. And I, I became conscious of it not through the environmental movement, which I found to be a little bit, um, uh, not scary, but scaring. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. all, it's a bit negative. Or scaremongering. Perhaps. Yeah, well, they're not scaremongering. They're, they're trying to give a message across, which is a fair message. It's just <laughs> that it's very difficult to do it positively. So you say this and this and this is happening, which means the polar ice cap is going to melt and sea levels are going to go and lots of people are going to drown. Mm. And that's like the scientific message. There's not, there's not much of a narrative that goes with it. Mm. And then I began to um, uh, read, you know, the stories of Krishna, the stories of Rama, the philosophy of the Upanishads, the Vedas and all that. And then you begin to get a completely different narrative, a whole different story about nature. The Upanishads are all about nature. All the philosophical metaphors are expressed through nature. The connection with nature is very strong. The respect for nature, the, the respect for all life, that was like mind blowing for me. Mm -hmm. But the biggest issue, um, that the way that I started to engage with the environment really was um, a story about Swami Prabhupada uh, when I first went to Mayapur in West Bengal, so this is a this is a big place of pilgrimage. And when I first went there, there were three buildings. Now it's a it's it's a it's a huge place. It's practically a city, but there were three buildings. And Swami Prabhupada was in one of the buildings, and he looked out across a big, wide area, and there was another long building with all the brahmacharis and guests. And there was at the end of one building, there was a light on. And he said, why is that light on? It was in a corridor, it was nighttime. And uh, no one could answer why the light was on. And he was disturbed about this. And I remember I was reading the story, I was like, why is he disturbed about that? It's just a light. And then he said, and all the devotees who were talking, well, they're light, we'll find out who did it and all that kind of stuff. So just turn it off. And then what the devotees were trying to figure out as well, what, what's wrong? And, uh, and Prabhupada said, this is Krishna's energy. And so it wasn't, it wasn't about Dharma and it wasn't about environmentalism and it wasn't about medical science or economy, you know, that is costing money or it wasn't about anything like that. It's that this is Krishna's energy. Why would you waste it? And it was so personal that it really, it really got me thinking in a very different way. So for me, the environment is, I, I love gardening, for instance, and to create an environment in a garden. So I plant X number of flowers uh, every year, you know, when spring comes and I, I want to offer those flowers on the altar. 
and make an offering to Krishna. And that's a nice thing. And you also do it in a nice way in the garden. Um, but slugs and snails. Has anyone met slugs and snails? Yeah. They're aggressive little chaps. They come and eat everything. <laughs> and they don't ask permission. And they don't say please or thank you. <laughs> so, you know, uh, what do you do about them? Well, you can get these pellets that kill them. Ha ha. Or you can get salt and put it all around. That kills them. Ha 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 ha. But why would I want to kill them? Because they're also Krishna's servants. They're just in a very awkward body. You know, a slug body. Not my thing. Uh, but it's not my place to, you know, mess around with their environment. It's not my environment. It's my garden, I can say. My garden. You know, I come into this garden for X number of years and consider it mine. Then I die. Some other guy comes in and considers it his. But who owns the garden? Well, Krishna always owned the garden without doubt. So Krishna owns the environment, this little garden environment that I think so precious, that I think I'm controlling and owning. But sarvam. Krishna owns and controls everything. So just knowing that, I know that these slugs and snails, they have every right to exist in this garden. Mm -hmm. Now, if they get a bit populous, if they're a bit too frisky and populate themselves too much, then I have to go around some morning at five o'clock in the morning, you come out and you can practically hear them eating. So you just go around with a flashlight and you pick them all up and you take them for a walk. Yeah. You invite them to leave the garden and go somewhere else. Yeah. And I, I live in the country, so I go to a field, yeah. tip them over and go back again. But I also grow about 20% more flowers than I need so that they also have something to eat because why not? They're going to eat my flowers anyway. I might as well just get with the program and understand how, how nature works. So if I'm part of the cosmic order, then if they live here and I live here, fair enough. <laughs> you know, <laughs> They're going to eat my flowers. I need X number of flowers. Then I'll grow 20% extra. And to me, that's good economics because it's good for the environment. It creates a an equitable system where we can all respect each other and get on with life and not be not be worried i don't have to squeeze every penny out of every seed you know that's that's maximization of profit but maximization of anything is an extreme and it's unsustainable so then you create an environment that's extreme and unsustainable where i have to kill all the slugs and snails now what other what other living beings in my garden are necessary? Uh, the, do the slugs and snails make necessary? You know, are, are they depending on? So I'm I'm disadvantaging the whole of the environment if I if I take that route. So I'm not interested in the economy of the situation. If if I see it in the eyes that that Samadarshana, the idea of of all life is sacred, and then that everyone and everything belongs to Krishna, then my attitude is one of service. How do I serve this space to the best of, of you know, I want to serve it, to serve Krishna. I want to get the flowers to offer to Krishna, but in getting the flowers, I'm willing to kill the slugs. Is that gonna make Krishna happy? No. <laughs> so what am I thinking? So if I think in terms of everything in the garden is for Krishna, including the flowers, they're also living entities. So I'm growing them to give them an opportunity to also serve Krishna by picking them and offering them. So the whole environment becomes Krishna. Every moment I spend in the garden is service to Krishna. It's not a waste of time at all. It's all good. And in that way, we can create an environment where we can all live together uh, in Krishna's service. And the slugs are doing their service. I don't know what it is, but it's not my place to know what it is. Can't understand the point of a slug, but they're there, they're doing some kind of a service and they're keeping the, the balance of the ecosystem. Maybe they feed the birds or some such thing. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so that's a, a long-winded answer to your... No, thank you. you. You've helped connect. We have to connect everything back to Krishna and, and see everything in relation to Krishna and, and that way it becomes much more balanced. Well, we don't have to, but we choose to, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We, we had some others who wanted to ask some questions. Would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, Nathan?
if you're there. Otherwise, uh, Nitai, Nitai Das. Oh, sorry. You should be able to unmute yourself now, Nathan. Seemingly doesn't want to. <laughs> not letting you? I'll ask to unmute. Am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Ah, okay, cool. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, that was such a great talk, and I really loved what you said about um, how it's we should view the environment as Krishna's garden, and we're just servants to it. Um, but it made me think about the modern dairy industry, and uh, I'm not talking about like a Himsa Farms necessarily, but the modern dairy industry has a huge negative impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, what to speak of the treatment of the cows, um, so um, how do we reconcile funding that industry? Um, and do you think that devotees without access to Himsa have an obligation to avoid milk for the meantime? And what direction should Is Ishkong go forward uh, with regards to the dairy industry? I don't think it's um, ISKCON as an institution has to make a decision about that one way or the other. I think it's up to individuals to decide for themselves how they uh, uh, de deal with this issue. Um, because um, it's difficult for a, an institution like ISKCON to come out with edicts all the time. And every five minutes we'll be coming out with another edict. So much like the Mahabharat, it's not about rules, it's about principles. So what are your principles? And everyone's principles, that our tradition is self-regulatory. We don't tell people what to do. We don't tell them how to act. We just give them principles by which they can act. And then they use those principles. Everyone interprets them individually because we're all individuals. We're all individuals with an individual relationship with Krishna. So it's important that ISKCON doesn't pronounce on these things and become another church organization in a Western model because the Eastern model is very different. So if we have our own individual principles that are important to us. So for instance, years and years ago, I decided that to practice Ahimsa, I shouldn't wear leather. I know a lot of devotees who wear leather, but I, that's not their thing. They didn't think about it in the same way. So I think about it in my way. And so we all lead our individual life and we're asked in our culture in Gaudiya Vaishnavism or in Indian culture in general, philosophically, to be very broad-minded, to look at the bigger picture, look into other traditions, look into other ways of thinking and seeing, but to be very conservative in our personal practice. And I'm conservative because I chose my principles and I chose consequently how I interpret those principles and how that helps me act. And everyone has to do that for themselves. So I know that my way of acting, my personal sadhana, is going to be different than every other devotee. But to be broad-minded means that I look at the other devotee and know that they made their decision based on the way they see the world. And that could be 10 times better than me. But it doesn't mean that I can follow it. I just have to do what I can do. And there's some other person who doesn't do half of what I do, but they could be 10 times more sincere than me. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not my thing. So we have to decide for ourselves how to approach this. So when we look at the dairy industry, yeah, that's very difficult in modern, in modern times. <laughs> it's very difficult to look at the dairy industry and, and see, you know, what, what do we do about this? Because animals are treated so badly. So personally, I try, I don't have access to a Himsa milk. So I try always to use organic milk because organic cows are generally treated treated better. So I can do that. I'm also conscious of the fact that as a vegetarian, I need vitamin B12 and milk is a very good source of it. So that's an issue for me as well. I can't cook. And my wife passed away a few years ago and she was a very good cook. So I'm kind of left in a situation where I don't have a lot of options. <laughs> I have to be, I have to make sure that I get the proper nutrition in my diet. So that's my thing. So I don't, I, I have a lot of vegan friends who are devotees and non-devotees, but I, I eat vegan food liberally, no issue at all, but I'll also eat uh, milk and I try and keep it to organic if I can. So that's just me in my, in my thing. So that's how I practice my ahimsa. So I'm not going to take up arms against the industry. 
I know it's it's a uh, it's a lot of rubbish and how they treat the animals. I'm going to try and help elevate people's consciousness in another way. But I will tell you a practical story about Srila Prabhupada in Chicago. Um, the devotees explained to him he he uh, complimented the beautiful milk sweets that they were offering to the deities there, and he said this is very nice. Krishna likes milk, and he likes these milk sweets. And then the devotees explained that the local government in Chicago um, had mandated that fish oil be added to the milk for vitamins and minerals for the populace. And uh, they said, what should we do, Prabhupada? And Prabhupada said, that's okay. <laughs> so take that and chew on that for a while. <laughs> See where you go. But Prabhupada knew that the devotees at that stage in ISKCON, our whole diet was about milk. You know, all the ghee was made in the temple. Every, nearly every devotee lived in a temple. All the temples made fresh ghee regularly. Everything was cooked in ghee. Everything was paneer and butter and yogurt, all freshly made, all made in the temples, all offered to Krishna. Uh, so Prabhupada knew that our whole diet was based on that. And that's what he said in that circumstance. So everything is according to time, place, and circumstance. In another conversation, the devotees said, um, in the 70s with the Cold War, there was always the prospect of nuclear war, etc. And the devotees said, what if there was a nuclear war, Prabhupada? What should we do? And Prabhupada said, well, you should chant Hare Krishna. I said, well, practically, Prabhupada, if there's no food to eat, you know, should we eat meat? And Prabhupada, and there was a big discussion about this among the devotees, and they asked Prabhupada, and Prabhupada said, you can. I won't. Uh, so, so what's he saying? <laughs> He's saying that it's individual. You have to decide these things for yourself in the circumstance. What if uh, you're there with, you've got three children in your family, it's not just you. With Prabhupada, it was just him. He only had to account for himself. He wasn't going to start eating meat at the age of, in his 70s. You know, he's led his whole life and all of a sudden he starts eating meat. Not worth it. But maybe you're there with three young children. Then, then what are you going to do? So Prabhupada was, he wasn't saying that that circumstance isn't a difficult circumstance. He was just saying what he would do. So these, these issues of Dharma are, uh, Yudhisthira in the Mahabharata used the word shukshma, which means subtle. To discern Dharma is subtle. It's according to the time, place, and circumstance. And you also have to choose your fights. If you want to take on the dairy industry, that's a fight. It's not a fight that I'm willing to dedicate my life to because it's not worth it for me. It's, I'm involved in education and developing Gaudiya studies and, and Hindu studies so that devotees have a lot more to reflect on. So the discussions that we're having now, we can have informed discussions. Um, maybe I should just be giving a regular Sunday feast and telling you what to do, but I don't think that that's fair. I think you're all intelligent people and this is these are the things our Acharya has said. And to create an educational system where you can send your children to get an Oxford degree in thinking through how to do this is really going to benefit our society. And then greater minds than me will figure out what to do with the dairy industry. So that's my personal uh, contrib contribution. I, I, taking on the dairy industry isn't worth it for me on a personal level. I hope that's helpful and hasn't confused your mind more. Or if it has, that also might be a positive thing because thinking about things isn't bad. Yeah, plenty of food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask Nitai Das to ask his question. You can kindly unmute yourself. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Yes. I, I can hear you. Oh, Hare Krishna, Shana Karishi Prabhu. Thank you so much for this class. A lot of... Um, uh, food for thought and uh, I just had a question I've written it down I'll just read it um, as um, devotees should we accept uh, the scientific consensus of climate disruption and not suspect any foul play in regards of fudging or changing the data due to different motivated interests um, could it be that we lose sight of the real issue of lowering pollution in pursuit of the single-pointed approach of reducing CO2? 
Yes, I'm just, I'm trying to visualize you, Nitai. I'm seeing you there as a, a sage with a matted hair, top knot and a beard and uh, looking very sage-like, but there you go. Can't see all of those. Um, uh, I think it's, it, uh, <laughs> it's my, this might sound a little bit strange. Uh, I don't really care. <laughs> because I don't think that's the issue. I don't think it's one of those issues. I think it's a different issue, as we discussed uh, earlier on. I think, I think the real issue is, is doing the right thing. And what's the right thing to do? And, and the, the options you've given um, aren't the right parameters. You know, is there a kind of a conspiracy? Are people fudging data and all that kind of stuff? I don't care. I don't care if people are fudging data or not. I just want to do the right thing. And I don't care about the data because the data doesn't tell me very much. The data only tells me that there is climate change and it can point to some possible causes. And we're fairly certain now based on data that it is human cause. Well, I was certain of that in the 1970s. It was kind of obvious, you know, I didn't have to prove that to myself. So my personal issue is how do I do the right thing or how collectively can we do the right thing? irrespective of the data. It's not because of the data that I'm doing the right thing. It's because of Dharma. It's because of Ahimsa. It's because of Karuna. It's because I don't want to be greedy. And I don't want to be an angry, lusty person just out for myself, trying to stamp my name on everything and say that I'm the great guy and all that kind of stuff. That's the reason why I don't want, that's the reason why I want to see uh, the environment taken seriously. And overriding all of that is because it pleases Krishna. I can just visualize Krishna with a smile on his face because I've helped create a little garden, because I've helped do someone else create a little garden, because we've all we all consider ourselves gardeners in Krishna's lovely garden, but also gardeners of the heart. That by doing this gardening, we're also focusing on, I'm serving Krishna, or I'm gardening my own heart by doing that. And by guarding my heart, I'm challenging my greed and my anger and my lust because they need to be challenged. And I don't want to start challenging the data because all I can do is throw other data at it. And I don't have that data. So some scientist comes and throws data at me. Some politician comes and throws sound bites at me. I don't know if he's talking bull or not, but I'm not going to spend the time to find out because generally all these people are talking bull I, is my humble opinion. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not very impressed by our leadership at any level. I, I really want to know what's the right thing to do. And I want to do the right thing, the thing that will please Krishna, that will put a smile on Krishna's face. And I know that the politicians, the economists, and the scientists, if they're not thinking like that, they won't be able to help me. So that's that's my personal take on that. And that may or may not be, that might be small minded or big minded, but it's just what I'm convinced of. I hope that's okay, Nitai. I'm imagining you there with your top knot on your beard and a smile on your face. Thank you. Um, we had a question from Nikhil. Do you, would you like to ask your question? If you'd unmute yourself. Uh, Hare Krishna, thank you. Thank you, Prabhu, for such enlightening session. So my question is uh, is mainly around the fact that uh, we are now in a phase where we have the industries of all nature. So we have some industries which are in the mode of passion, but some are in the mode of ignorance as well, where they've been into uh, um, meat, cut meat eating and, and all, all such kind of business. So I'm just wondering that uh, does such kind of industries would have impact on the uh, on the overall material nature? So the karmas, the kind of karmas that these industries are generating, would they have an impact on the material nature? Um, well, yes. I mean, if it's very unfortunate since our industrial revolutions around the world in the last two hundred and fifty years. Um, They've been very self-serving and based on greed. 
and very unconscious of the environment in which we live and also very unconscious and uncaring of their impact on other living beings, including humans. So the motivational basis behind it all has been greed. And um, I just think anything, any big development like this um, that is based on such a, a shaky ground has no endurance. This system can't last. And, and we say, well, it's lasted 250 years and it's very good. We have great technology, brilliant infrastructure and all that. But push comes to shove, it can't last. And 250 years is absolutely nothing. And, and what's nature's response in 250 years? Well, in March of this year or in or January or sometime, this tiny little invisible COVID thing appears out of nowhere and brings the whole edifice of Western industrialization and social development, economic development, political life, industrial life, corporate life, technological life, just brings it all to a halt. We have no response. And we've come up with a vaccine. We've got another vaccine, hey, another vaccine. But we know for a fact that this is only one tiny virus. We could have another one next year. We have no idea. So nature sends in one of its most tiny, insignificant soldiers just to give us a wake up call. And 250 years in the light of eternity and nature is nothing. And she, she, she shows her force with such elegance. It's such an elegant show of force. It's not quite incredible. <laughs> anyway, I just look at, at that scenario and I look at all our karma that you know we're, we're doing all this and we're pushing nature. So karma isn't a law of nature. It's not a spiritual law. It's actually got nothing to do with spiritual life at all. In fact, all the Buddhists and Jains and Hindus and Sikhs, they're all trying to get away from karma. That's the whole idea. Just get, get out of this pull of karma. So it's, it's the second law of motion for every action. There is an equal and opposite reaction. So we pull the elastic band that much, it goes back that much. We mess with nature this much, it messes with us that much. That's all that's going on. So yeah, there's going to be a, there is a collective karma. And I, I see that, yeah, this, there's, there are going to be reactions to it. It's, it's inevitable. If, if, we, if we do this kind of stuff, we're, we're going to get it in the neck. <laughs> and we are slowly getting it in the neck. And as I say, we think we're doing great because we have iPads. <laughs> But uh, they're not the they're not they're not making us happy. Our relationships are making us happy, and our relationship with each other, our relationship with Krishna, our relationship with our environment, our relationship with other living beings. That's what makes us happy. It it makes us happy when a dog comes up and nuzzles up against us, and we we give him a rub and all that kind of stuff. There's a relationship has just happened, and we become happy within ourselves. We become happy when we see a horse that comes over and bends his, bends his head over the, the fence and nuzzles up in some way. That makes us happy. It's only a bloody horse. <laughs> but relationship, it's only a bloody relationship. <laughs> Relationships are the essence of our life. And you can't have a relationship with an iPad. And if you are having a relationship with an iPad, you need help. I hope that's somewhat helpful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I was remembering one story actually um, I heard uh, recently with uh, Radhanath Swami. He was in India waiting at one of the airports when he was leaving um, to come to somewhere in the West. And he bumped into a, a politician and the politician said to him, um, you know, I've got, I've got a really important question for you. And uh, he said, um, uh, she said, actually, um, you know, I see that you're, you know, he's referring, she was referring to him and she said, I see that many monks, you know, spend all of their time just, you know, practicing their own spirituality, but what are they doing about the environment? And um, so he, he was listening to her and she, she kind of conveyed many points about, you know, there's so many things to do, there's so many problems and how are we going to fix all of it? Who's going to clean up all the rivers and all the pollution and so forth. And, um, um, and so he listened and then and he she said um uh you know i just see that you're spending all your time chanting 
and 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 doing all of these things you know all these spiritual things but you're not getting involved in the practical problems that we have and so his response back to her was he first he said a prayer and then <laughs> he, he responded back to her and said um you know if, let, let's say we clean up all the rivers let's say we clean up all the pollution today tomorrow somebody will come along and pollute everything all over again because the pollution of their heart which is what you are saying about our internal climate it reflects externally in our climate so he said if we don't deal with the pollution in our hearts even if we clean up everything in the future somebody else will come along and mess everything up all over again just because we haven't dealt with our inner pollution yes yeah no it's a, it's a very good point and that that reflects um something that gandhi said that that is also um opposite to this he said there's enough there's enough on the planet for every man's need but not enough for one man's greed and it just takes one person, one greedy person, to take more than their quota, to create an imbalance that has a knock-on effect. It takes one angry person to start a conflict. Mm. And we can all be peaceniks and all go around and say, peace and love, man, and we just want peace in the world. There will be no peace in the world as long as there is one angry person, one bitter person, one greedy person. So yeah the, why waste our time with that kind of stuff when we have to do so much to garden our own heart to create the environment of our own heart so that that can be reflected in the bigger environment and we may think that that's not significant but as much as one person one angry greedy person can influence one person who is loving and kind and generous and compassionate can do the same so there is something we all can do and should do and we shouldn't do it because of environmentalism we should do it out of love for krishna and if we do it out of love for krishna all the needs of the environment are solved if we do it simply for environmentalism we solve nothing we just we just clean up the river just like radnath swami says we we clean up the forest we plant new trees and then someone comes along another generation cuts them all down because we haven't dealt with the garden in our heart. The environment of our heart, that inner climate is the issue. And if we if we're saying that if we're looking somewhere else to solve the issue, we're ultimately not going to solve it. So thanks. Thanks, Jagannath. That's a very good, very good point you bring in. Thank you. Um, uh, we have time maybe for one question. And then I think we are at a conclusion for our for our event. Uh, if anybody else would like a question uh, or like to ask a question, please um, feel free. You should be able to unmute. If you can't, then I will. I can help if you just let us know in the chat. Okay. I think uh, that's everybody. You you can wave if uh, if you have a question. Uh, Minesh, do you have anything on your side? Minish fell asleep. <laughs> no, I just managed to unmute myself now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, actually, I've got one very quick question. Um, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, consumerism, which is driving a lot of um, the demand for resource on the planet. Um, and then, you know, that demand is there because there's a lot of population growth, at least in the last... 100 years or so. Um, what's your opinion on, you know, how sustainable is the, the world population and going into the future, the growth of the world population? Well, uh, this was an, an issue that uh, the Reverend Malthus took up in the early part of the 19th century and, and wrote about it um, in rather draconian ways. Um, his, his kind of thinking led to the kind of thinking that developed ideas of um, uh, eugenics, uh, which led to the kind of thinking that led to the gas chambers of Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, <laughs> it's a difficult issue. <laughs> um, and some people are still quite convinced of Malthus's analysis that human population growth is creating unsustainable social issues and economic issues, etc. So it's it's a very detached rationalist observation that doesn't take people into account very much. 
And I always shy away from such rationalizations. Now, in the early 19th century, the, the population, um, the population of the planet was very low compared to now. I mean, now it's 1.2 billion in India. In the early part of the 19th century, it was uh, 200,000 maximum. So, you know, this is one of the more populated parts of the planet. So the fact is, the he was saying that the population then was unsustainable, uh, you know, 200 years ago. And now it's, it's, it's beyond anything he would have conceived. And we're still somehow sustaining because we're not in charge of sustaining. That's specifically Krishna's department. Uh, but the fact is that nature will sustain and nature will withdraw sustenance as well. So anything could happen. We, we don't know what, what, how nature balances these things. If the population gets too much, maybe there's some cataclysm, there's some disease like another tiny virus that just wipes out half the population of the planet. There, you're back again. You know, so um, in the Middle Ages, um, one third of the population of England was wiped out by plague. I mean, one third of the population, more than one third of the population of Europe was wiped out by plague. So there are all kinds of ways that nature just readjusts things. Re and they all happen naturally. And uh, people are worried now about the fact that males in developed countries aren't, don't have enough testosterone to produce the right amount of semen to reproduce properly. So... That, that could who knows what's going on you know what's what's happening in the background so i'm personally not worried about it because i don't control it i just know that the cycles of nature are interesting and dynamic and fairly well thought through and uh it you know if there's a volcano or a tsunami and all that kind of stuff devastating as it is it is it is part of one of the cycles of nature it just is how nature works and some weeks ago, I was with a friend of mine and we were together and she was dying. And I just sat with her and her family through that process. And that's one of the natural processes. It's not something that we pray for. It's not something that we look forward to, but it's gonna to happen to all of us. And it's just one of the cycles of nature and I can safely say that that person's passing was so auspicious. It was so devotional, so spiritual uh, for herself and the whole family. She was such, she became a pure devotee in her last months. Uh, it was an incredible event to be part of. And I feel that all the work I've done in Oxford and all that kind of basis for acclaim or whatever, um, I'm not going to remember that in my retirement. I'm going to remember that time with that friend of mine, because that was more substantial than anything else I did, helping that person pass away. And I'm not going to worry about population growth or things like that. Nature will balance all that stuff out. It's kind of not my department, really, very much above my pay grade. Um, but I can I can help this person with the cycle of life on, on a, not on a, how many millions of people are on the planet, but just one person. If I can do a service for that one person properly and we all together help create a spiritual environment, that to me is the environment that I'm looking for. I'm not looking for the material environment. Nature has that covered. Nature, by the way, is Bhumi Devi and Bhumi Devi is a person and she, she stands at Krishna's left side. When, with Vishnu, you have Lakshmi and Vishnu, and on the other side is Bhumi Devi. So Bhumi Devi is one of the consorts of Vishnu. And when there's trouble on the planet, all the demigods go to Bhumi Devi. When Bhumi Devi goes to Brahma, Brahma goes to Krishna and the avatar comes down. Bhumi Devi is quite special. And our, our texts are some of the only texts on the planet that have Bhumi Devi actually speaking. We hear the voice of Mother Nature. She actually speaks in the Vedas, in the Srimad Bhagavatam. She actually talks to us. We understand what she has to say and how, she's, how she is affected by how we uh, treat her. 
and, and how protective Krishna is of Bhumi Devi on a very personal level. Bhumi Devi is his consort, is his friend. So my friendship with other people is more important to me than another statistic of how many people are on the planet and how are we going to deal with that. We're not going to deal with that. Nature has this covered. As I say, way above our pay grade. We have to take care of each other. You have a lovely community in Redbridge. How are you going to take care of your Krishna conscious environment? How are you going to take care of each other in the good times and the bad times? When one of you gets cancer or heart disease, when one of you gets elected to parliament, when one of you uh, wins the lottery, how are you going to interact with each other and care for each other? That's that's to me is more important than conceptual ideas about um, the number of people on the planet and what we're going to do about it. We're not going to do anything about it. <laughs> we're just going to talk about it like they do in every Irish pub every night. Every, all the Irish people come together in a pub at night and we all discuss the problems of the world and Donald Trump and Boris Johnson and and Putin and everything, and we solve them all, and we get so drunk we forget, and we come back the next night and we do it again. <laughs> and that's that's us talking about overpopulation. We have no idea. They've been talking about it for 200 years. No one's been able to do anything about it. Thank you. Uh, and I believe uh, we have a final question from Vimal. Thank you. Um, I joined a bit late, so um, my question is based on your answer to a previous question from Umer, um, and it was mainly, what is the three top tips that you can give for cleansing the environment of our heart? The three top tips? Oh, gosh. Sounds like, sounds like a broadcast I should be doing on YouTube or TikTok or... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know... the. The whole of spiritual life in 30 seconds. Uh, well, uh, the first thing is to realize that everything is about relationships. There's nothing more important than relationships. And of all the relationships, our relationship with Krishna is the most loving and sustaining and beautiful. And if we get that relationship right, that relationship will be reflected in every relationship we have. So that's, that's the first thing. That's the most dynamic thing that will change our heart. The second thing um, would be, uh, well, it's to do with relationships as well, but it's Sangha. It's what we're doing here. It's, it's coming together as individuals to talk about our spirituality and to share about our spirituality and to, to think, you know, to put energy into that. We put energy into so many things but to put real energy into nurturing our spirituality. And part of Sangha is sadhana, which is practice. That by the association of other devotees and, and wonderful people, we, we start to practice spiritual life. We start to take on principles and practices and change our life and make our life different. So to transform our life, that happens through, the, through working with other people. So when you meet people who are inspiring people, then you become inspired and you change. That's just that's just how the world works again. Uh, certainly, certainly how spiritual life works. And that transforms our heart. And then I think the third thing is chanting. Chanting is a very dynamic uh, process. You're, you're chanting God's name, which means you you are in contact with God by saying Krishna. God is right there. So you, you have an immediate contact with God. And by saying the name of God, that pure sound vibration starts to clean, cleanse our heart. Uh, Prabhupada likened it to cleaning a dirty mirror. So you're looking at a mirror and you don't notice it. But if you run your finger across it and there's some dust on it, all of a sudden you notice it. <laughs> and once you've run your finger across it, the difficulty is then you're kind of in a position where you have to you have to clean the rest of it. You, know, you, you kind of blew it for yourself. <laughs> so once you start practicing spiritual life, you have to, once you expose yourself so that by chanting, you begin to realize what the issues are. That's, that's part of the purification. 
it's like it's like turning up the if you're making ghee if any of you have ever made ghee you put all these butter in a pot and you turn on the heat and it all melts and then slowly all the impurities start to rise to the surface so what you're looking at looks terrible <laughs> it doesn't look nice at all and you have to skim it all off and then they keep on rising and eventually you skim it off and you're just left with this pure golden liquid that looks quite gorgeous but initially it doesn't look great at all so this the chanting is like that all of a sudden you begin to realize who you are and it's not pretty because you see the lust you see the anger and you see the greed but unless you see it unless we own it and then we commit to doing something about it so krishna just exposes us to ourselves so chanting is very powerful and as that's happening as as we're beginning to see ourselves our heart is beginning to change because it's being influenced by the chanting as well and chanting is best done in congregation i know in covid times that's terrible but when you're when you're with other people it's so easy to chant so as much as possible the community should organize as many zoom chantings or whatever you can get just to get people together to chant but when covid lessons and we can meet together try and organize or get to as many kirtans as possible um because i know when i go to a kirtan when i leave so in the kirtan my mind is all over the place my mind is saying oh i wish i was at home now I, uh, such and such or maybe there's something on the tally or whatever's going on but as soon as you leave the kirtan you realize how much you've changed and as you're walking away and walking home or walking to the car you feel yourself coming back down into the world again and realizing oh i have to put the milk out or whatever is going on in your head so the chanting has a an immediate tangible effect but a much more profound long term effect so i would say those three things our relationship with krishna our relationship with devotees and our relationship with the the name as a process of purification that really influences the heart